For many centuries, London was a dangerous place. It was a magnet for the very worst kind of people. Jack the Ripper dominated the headlines. But he wasn't the only killer around. Murder was afoot. And the fear of death was everywhere. But police had their work cut out to track the culprits down. In this series, we'll be investigating some of the country's most notorious and intriguing crimes. The female defendant. Sexual intrigue. Vicious murder. As well as the latest technology fed the nation's insatiable desire for gruesome stories of London's dark side. Sunday, the 31st of May, 1953. The coronation of Elizabeth II was just days away. Visitors from all across the world were filling London, and the city was in the mood for a party. It could do with one. Many districts still bore the scars of the Blitz. Others were shabby with post-war austerity and memories were fresh of the great smog that had cloaked London the previous December. The freak weather event had trapped filthy air over the city and killed thousands. London was getting ready for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. So the newspapers were, of course, full of all those royal events. This was when the whole country was excited, focused on the coronation, which was moving towards a whole new era because you had a young queen, you had the hope of a new Elizabethan age, you had the hope that finally we were moving away from the austerities of war. England was coming out of just about the Depression rationing was still in force but it was lessening more and more things were becoming available there was a great sense of jubilation it was party time and i have to say i remember it because i just entered my teens and i can remember all the fun and things that were going on the country was enjoying an extended spell of warm and dry weather in the west London town of Tellington, the public swimming pool was packed. And down by the river, 
dozens of young people have set up camp in a vast, undeveloped area of meadows and gravel pits. Teddington Lock is the point where the Thames, having travelled 96 miles, stops being a tidal river. This is where it all changes at Teddington Lock. The towpath and the banks, there were a whole series of people camping at a weekend. Campsites like that up and down the Thames were extremely popular. It was a way of breaking monotony and routine. It was freedom they were getting now after the restrictions which there had been during the war and, and certainly for years afterwards. Why not take what seems to have been an absolutely beautiful weekend to go and do some camping? Among the revelers that warm Sunday evening were three teenage boys. The friends had camped by the river a few hundred yards from Teddington Lock. They were later joined by two local girls, Barbara Songhurst and Christine Reed. These were just good-hearted, cheerful, modern young women, enjoyed life, looking forward to the coronation. Barbara was going to appear in a bathing beauty contest to mark the coronation. They came from working class families it was a sort of fairly local community. They had been friends for some length of time. They were around together in the cafes and cinemas a great deal of the time. They were church-going, they were virtuous, they were respectable, modern young girls. On Sunday the 31st of May, the girls decided to take advantage of the clement weather and set off on their bikes toward the rural area around Teddington Lock. Barbara was staying with Christine and one of them had known three boys who were setting up a tent in the camping site on the river bank and the girls took their bicycles out, rode over to see them. There'd obviously been a lot of playing around. The boys had hidden the girls' bicycles. They'd been chasing and they'd been kissing, and it was teenage fun. The girls came back to Christine's for lunch, rode out again, came back for tea, and rode out again in the evening. The warm, bright night was enticing. The teenagers left the Reed House again at 8 p.m and cycled back to the boys' camp by the river. They stayed there until almost midnight. Then, with a cheerful goodbye, they cycled off into the darkness. See you tomorrow. See ya. Christine? On the 1st of June, 
men from the Port of London Authority arrived at Tennington to perform repairs on the river embankment. They were working 800 yards downstream of the lock. At 8.15 a.m., they spotted something in the water. It was the body of a teenage girl. Police examination found she'd been the victim of a savage attack. She'd been struck over the head with an ax and stabbed repeatedly in the chest. The girl had also been sexually assaulted before her body was dumped in the river. The victim was Barbara Songhurst. The body was noticed floating in the river by a passing cyclist who cast his eye across the river and saw something strange, realized that it was a body, raised the alarm and brought the police in. She'd been terribly assaulted and battered and, and raped. And of course, that then started off a murder hunt. Detective Superintendent Herbert Hannam of Scotland Yard opened a murder investigation. Bert Hannam was a Londoner. He was a short man, but stiff-backed and broad-shouldered. He was an imposing figure all the same. There was something aristocratic in his bearing, which he enhanced with dapper suits and smart gloves. Press and colleagues nicknamed him the Count. The investigation started with uh, Herbert Hannam, a detective superintendent from Scotland Yard, very experienced detective. Hannam said he was going to search the river and wanted it dammed. And apparently, according to the Daily Express, 20,000 people came to watch. The murder scene was soon found. Teddington Lock. Blood stained the gravel of the towpath. There was more splashed over the grass and soaked into the earth nearby. Hannam had no doubt. This was where the young woman was attacked. Scattered in the wild undergrowth beyond the footpath, they found first one pair of women's shoes, but then another. Police were no doubt that these belonged to Christine Reed. Two days later, Christine's bike was recovered from the Thames. It would be another four days, however, before Christine herself would be found. On the 6th of June, a week after the murders, the police team dragging the river reached Glover's Island. It was there, two miles downstream from Teddington Lock, that Christine's body was discovered. Like Barbara, she too had suffered blunt head injuries. She had been stabbed over 10 times and brutally raped as she died. The violence of the attacks shocked even experienced police. Chief Inspector Hallam's investigation soon became one of the largest murder hunts England had seen for years. The press, fed by twice daily police briefings, followed every development. The search involved dogs, mine detectors, and draining part of the river. But no trace of the murder weapon was found, and Barbara's bicycle remained missing. Police feared the killer had fled abroad. The press speculated he would soon strike again. A week after the gruesome murder, a 49-year-old woman was walking her dogs alone in Windsor Great Park when she was grabbed by a man he told her he had a knife and knew how to use it. He tried to drag her into the bushes, but she struggled. Her attacker gave up and fled the scene on a bicycle. The woman later described to the police the powerfully built young man who had assaulted her. The News of the World put out a thousand pound reward for information. It must have been a local man. It was a man who was an expert knife thrower. Also, he had a cleft chin, and this was starting to match up with the identification of the woman who'd been raped. It's not just the police who are instituting their inquiries going house to house. It's the reporters doing it as well. So they are interrogating all the young men of the 
area saying, who do you think did it? Who do you think did it? That's where one of them is prompted to say, well, if you're looking for a suspect, the kind of person I would expect is that chap there. He's a bad lot. The officers found the man, as promised, on Lockshot Heath. His name was Alfred Whiteway. He was 22 years old. The police asked him to accompany them for questioning. They placed Whiteway alone in the back of the car and drove him to Kingston Police Station. He was searched and questioned. The questioning came to nothing. Whiteway was released. But he would soon come to the attention of Herbert Hannam and was hauled in and questioned again, this time by Hannam himself. I'll save you the time. When that job was done, I was with my wife. What time was that? The job? 11, wasn't it? I read it in the paper. Well, tell me more about it then. Well, all I can tell you is that I was indoors with the missus until 11.30, so it couldn't be me now, could it? How do you know you were indoors until 11.30? I know I was. I talked about it with her wife. You talked about it with her? Yeah, she'll tell you. Why were the two of you discussing your whereabouts? Because she asked me. You said you were with her. Were you not together? Yeah. Then why did she ask you where you were? I don't know, do I? Whiteway came from an impoverished background. He was born in London on the 21st of June, 1931. His mother was a domestic servant. His father would die of cancer when he was just 14. From a young age, Whiteway had trouble with the law. As a teenager, he appeared repeatedly before juvenile court and was sent to a reform school near Swindon. But his poor behavior continued there with the headmaster describing his conduct as most unsatisfactory. You could describe it as a very poor household. I think he'd got eight brothers and sisters, one of whom the police reports uh, describe as mentally defective. He was very poorly educated. And the suspicion must be that that was because either he had some kind of learning difficulties which were not identified, or that he was inattentive, disinclined to learn. He was certainly not interested in reading or anything like that. After a stint in prison for theft in 1948, Whiteway found work in construction. Fellow laborers remembered his great strength. They said he could climb scaffolding using his arms alone. Others recalled his temper and his obsession with knives. Throwing axes, machetes, hatchets, whatever came to hand, gave him a status that he was never going to have without it. He was married to a girl called Nellie. He'd apparently seen her more or less in the street and followed her and started chatting her up. Her mother, very sensibly, didn't approve of Whiteway at all. He was apparently a fairly a silent person. And what they did was they deliberately got pregnant. So mother would be forced to allow her to get married. She wouldn't allow him in the house. So they sat on the step, or if mother went out, he came in. And the relationship was consummated with sex in the alley. By May 1953, Whiteway was a married man with a little girl not yet two and a second child on the way. He did not live with his wife and child, however. His in-laws disapproved of him and he was forced to live with his mother, uncle and siblings in a cramped terraced house on Sydney Street in Teddington. 
it was less than a mile from the scene of the double murder. There was something about Whiteway's unusual domestic setup which prompted Hannam to dig a little deeper into his supposed movements on the night of the murders. So, you left your wife's home at 11.30 p.m. and then cycled to your mother's? Yeah. Which way did you go? Usual way. Over Kingston Bridge, Sandy Lane. Did anyone see you leave your wife's house? No. Did anyone see you on the bridge? No. Did anyone see you at Sandy Lane? Look, no one saw me until I got home, all right? Of course. <laughs> it was late. But someone did see you when you got home then? Yeah, my Uncle Charlie. You'll be able to confirm that, will he? Yeah. I got in just before 12. He'll know. He looked at the clock. Very well. There was no rush to secure a confession. Whiteway was being held on remand for the assault in Windsor Park, and he had already admitted the violent rape of a teenage girl earlier that year. Hannam compared Whiteway's alibi with statements given by his wife and mother-in-law. There were countless discrepancies. Whiteway's account of his movements on the night of the murders was falling apart. In the summer of 1953, police in London were investigating a double murder. Two teenage girls had been sexually assaulted and killed on the towpath at Teddington Lock. Their bodies were thrown into the river, where they were found days later. The police's prime suspect was Alfred Whiteway. He was being held in custody on charges of sexual assault, and his story as to his whereabouts on the night of the murder was just not adding up. Chief Inspector Hannam was slowly but surely building a case against Whiteway. What were you wearing that night? A shirt, gabardine trousers, the ones the police took, the green ones. What else? A rain jacket. I need shoes. We'll have to take a look at those too. While the interrogation of Whiteway continued, police, along with the pathology team, were building up a criminal profile and identified that their suspect would have had a keen interest in knives and possibly a talent for throwing them. This theory was consistent with the wounds suffered by both Barbara Songhurst and Christine Reed. There were wounds on her skull, which indicate that he used the axe. He proceeded to rape both his victims and subsequently stab them. They were stabbed and they were both axed. There were stab wounds in the back, and this led to a theory that he had thrown the knife at Barbara. Possibly both girls were murdered because Whiteway recognised Barbara Songhurst and thought that she might identify him. She was working as a chemist's assistant in a local shop, so possibly that's where she had seen him or he had seen her. We have to speculate that Alfie realised he had miscalculated, that he hadn't stopped a completely unknown girl that she had a companion, and that companion was known to him. And more than that, she knew and would be able to identify him. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was the sexual assaults on the victims which led Hannon to Whiteway. A series of rapes and attempted rapes had plagued the area at the time. Whiteway had been identified as the perpetrator and charged by a separate police unit. On learning of Whiteway's crimes, Adam had decided to question him about the murders. After already several attempts at trying to crack Whiteway, Hannam could not have imagined how tough he would be to convict. Further interviews followed on the 3rd, 8th and 15th of July, and everyone Whiteway denied involvement in the murders. His home was searched. 
but no trace of the murder weapons was found. Hannam was sure he had his man, but he still didn't have the evidence he needed to be sure of a conviction. This is Hannam. He has been moved now. He's at Brixton. We're waiting on the test results first. Yes. Precisely. Come in. Well, if there's a semen match, if there's blood on the shoes, well, then I think it all, it all adds up. My apologies, may I call you back? Thank you. Just came for us, sir. You won't believe where it's been. Hannam was convinced he had the murder weapon. But to be sure, it was sent away for forensic investigation, a lengthy process in those days. The circumstances of how the axe was found, however, would negate any hard evidence to link it to the attack. The axe is a really terrible story of neglect and misconduct. By that time, the police had discovered that they actually had the murder weapon, but they didn't know they had the murder weapon. After being arrested on suspicion of being a rapist, Alfie seems to have stuck the axe under the seat in the police car. Police were distracted in the front of the car. They hadn't searched him properly. He somehow took it out from his overalls and hid it. A police officer did actually find it and put it in his locker. And the significance of this axe was not apparent for um, quite a few days. The police officer went off sick and took it home when he came back and used it to chop wood. And he blunted it very substantially. And it's only uh, about a week after that that someone starts making inquiries. He says, oh, I've got, I've got the ax at home, I'll bring it in. And I think it's right to say he had his knuckles wrapped very sharply. While the ax was being tested, Hannam continued with his hard line of interrogation to elicit a confession. Do you know where these girls were murdered, Mr. Whiteway? Mr. Whiteway? Look, I'm keeping my bloody mouth shut. You seem afraid, Alfred. I'm not letting you lot pin this one on me. If you had nothing to do with it, what's there to be afraid of? Because I know what you bloody coppers are like. Yeah. I'll go any distance to get a bit from a girl, but not that far. You're wasting your time. The bloke that did that job is mad. Hmm. Whiteway's clothing had been sent for forensic testing. By modern standards, this was basic. Although the structure of DNA had been discovered that year by Francis Crick, James Watson, and Rosalind Franklin, it would be decades before genetic profiling could help police investigators. What could be detected in 1953, however, was the presence of blood. And it was blood which would become crucial in the investigation of the Towpath murders. But would it be enough? Hannam would find that in constructing a watertight case against Whiteway, his ethics would be tested, and police conduct would come into close scrutiny. Chief Inspector Hannam was frustrated. His investigation into the murders of Barbara Songhurst and Christine Reed had been a long and exhausting one. 
Now, at least he had a suspect in custody, Alfred Whiteway, a 22-year-old laborer who lived less than a mile from the murder scene. There was no doubt Whiteway was a violent predator. He had already confessed to attacking other women. But there was no direct evidence tying him to the double murder. The axe, mislaid by Kingston police, was now near useless as evidence. The knife used in the attack had still not been found, and no witnesses placed Whiteway at the scene of the crime. Hannam knew the case was a weak one. What he needed was a confession. By this time, Whiteway had been moved to Brixton Prison, awaiting trial for the sexual assault charges. Hannam continued his interrogation there. I told you this already. I had a row with a wife and I didn't leave her until 11.30. Was your wife's mother in when you left? How the devil do I know? I don't go in the house. She hates me. I see. I can tell you your wife's mother was there that night. And she insists your wife was in bed by 11 p.m. Well, she is a bloody liar. I was with my wife at 11.30. We had a cup of tea on the back step. Very well. We've spoken before about your shoes, your crepe sole shoes. Yeah. You said you were wearing them on the night of the 31st of May, is that correct? I've already said so, ain't I? So you were wearing those shoes? Look, it's the same bloody questions. I've already told you. Yes or no? Yes. I see. Did you ever get blood on either of them? No. Is there any reason at all why there might be blood stains on them? No. Very well. I must tell you, Mr. White, where your shoes have been examined. A scientific expert will say in court that one of them has been exposed to a great quantity of blood. Well, if they're saying that, then they're liars. They ain't got no blood on them. Cannon pretty well breaks him on that basis. So you were wearing those shoes, weren't you? They were also known as brothel creepers at the time. Um, they were not something that respectable young men really wore. They discovered traces of blood on Alfred Whiteway's shoes. And really, those traces of blood were crucial evidence. He'd apparently washed them, but done nothing more than that. There was enough to suggest that there was blood which had been washed, but there was enough to suggest that there were some stains. Hannam had one more ace up his sleeve. He had the axe, examination of which showed the curve of the blade matched the head wounds suffered by Barbara and Christine. Hannam knew this would be enough to unsettle Whiteway further. You're very fond of knives, aren't you, Mr. Whiteway? I didn't kill them girls. Axes too. Anything sharp, is that not right? Were you kidding about that blood being on my shoe? According to Inspector Hannam, 
It was at this point that White Wave finally cracked. He told police he could not control himself around women. He confessed to killing Barbara and Christine. On the 20th of August, he was charged with their murders. The nine-week-long investigation was at an end. Over 1,600 statements had been taken and 2,000 telephone messages received. But the mistakes made by police at Kingston and the failure of Hannam's team to find the murder weapon undermined the case against Whiteway. It would all rest on the confession. Whiteway's trial began on the 26th of October, 1953. The confession secured by Hannam became the battleground in court. Defense barrister Peter Rawlinson subjected the chief inspector to a grueling two-day cross-examination. It was, in the words of one newspaper, the duel at the Old Bailey. Rawlinson accused Hannam of manufacturing Whiteway's statement and tricking the young man into signing it. Whiteway said that he never made this statement. What happened was that he was given a set of sheets of paper. He was asked to sign them and told where to put his signature. But he's saying, in effect, that he was verbaled. Verbaling is what is called noble cause corruption. If the police know, quote, no, unquote, that somebody has done something and there isn't the evidence to back it up, they don't think they're doing anything wrong by helping convict a man whom they know did it. And this would be perhaps sometimes planting a bit of evidence on them. In this case, it was just the, the verbal confession. The whole defence was questioning the integrity of the admission of guilt that he made when he was confronted with the axe and the bloodstains on his shoe. This line of defence that the prisoner has been verbal is not unique. What sometimes happens is that the prisoner makes a statement, not realising the full significance of everything he or she is saying. And it's only when this has been pointed out to them by their solicitor or defence counsel that then they come up with their defence, this is a false confession. Police interviews were not recorded at this time. The only evidence to corroborate Whiteway's confession was Hannam's notebook and those of the other officers present. This was standard practice. It was not until 1991 that tape recording of interviews by British police became the norm. Hannam, of course, denied Rawlinson's accusations. He called the suggestion of police misconduct terrible and absolutely untrue. The judge and many onlookers criticized Rawlinson's approach. There was nothing else that Rawlinson really had to work on. He couldn't stand up and say, my character is a pillar of the community. So the only thing you can do is discredit the police case. And that is what Rawlinson does his best to do. And actually, by all accounts, did a pretty good job jury was out, what, 45 minutes, I think, f under the hour. And one of the interesting things is they sent in a question saying, when Hannam produced the axe, how long did he have it on the table before Whiteway? And when Whiteway signed the confession, had he still got it on the table? Presumably because that would have intimidated Whiteway. But if he'd put the axe away, then there was nothing for Whiteway to be scared about. What undermined the effectiveness of that part of the defence was that Alfie was such a bad lot, and so clearly such a bad lot, that the jury overlooked what otherwise, in another case, could have brought the prosecution case crashing down. At the end of the six-day trial, they found Whiteway guilty. He was sentenced to death. 
Following the trial, there was outcry over the tactics of the defense. For many, questioning the word of a police officer was beyond the pale. But in decades to come, the skepticism expressed by Rawlinson in court would spread. Bribery and corruption scandals engulfed elements of the London police in the 1970s. Internal investigations discovered police profiting from crime they were meant to be preventing. Officers took bribes, ensured charges against guilty men were dropped, and fabricated evidence against the innocent. His appeal was not successful. The only grounds for appeal in the English criminal justice system is that the law has in some ways not been properly followed through, that the case has been improperly handled, that evidence has been suppressed. Rawlinson's appeal was on the basis, it had to be on the basis, not that the jury was mistaken, but that the confession was forced out of him. It's actually perfectly possible that that is the case, but it was held by the court, by Lord Chief Justice Goddard, that there wasn't grounds for an appeal. There was no general outcry as there was, for example, with Ruth Ellis and other cases. No, he was not regarded with any sympathy at all. And if he's convicted of two rapes and murders of girls and the other rape and the attempted rape were left on the file, there's not a lot of room for sympathy. Whiteway was not innocent. He was a violent sex attacker. Had he not been caught, he would certainly have assaulted and possibly killed others. But we will never know whether he confessed to the murders of Barbara and Christine in the way police claim. Alfred Whiteway hanged on the 22nd of December, 1953. A few years later, after his retirement from Scotland Yard, Bert Hannum had advice for his former colleagues. Police, he said, should have the courage to do things the law forbids. What mattered to Hannum was seeing justice done, however it was reached. But no justice can truly compensate for two teenage girls who left home one Sunday morning with all their lives ahead of them and never returned.